KKHT wants you to meet three of the classiest guys in real estate. I am Chris Kelso, the maestro of mortgage. I am Rob Cook, the godfather of real estate. And I am Joe Orsack, the king of credit swing. And together, we're the, the real, real estate, estate Rat Pack. Pack. Much like us, real estate right now is smoking hot. So whether it's buying, selling, or owning, you need to check out the Real Estate Rat Pack. They're here to take your calls and answer your questions live. Call now, 1-800-808-5548. And now, the Real Estate Rat Pack! Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Stereo Howling, we're oh available. Oh yes, we are available for all parties, bar mitzvahs, <laughs> events. Well, I hope everyone survived the ice apocalypse of ice Houston apocalypse. <laughs> of ice 2014. Uh, you know, it was such a non-event again. But, you know, we've got a beautiful day today, which is great because, you know what, we've got a garage sale going on at my office at 741 East 11th Street. Uh, just kind of remind our uh, listeners that we had, uh, we're had doing a fundraiser for a friend of ours who was robbed, lost $25,000 in cash, and we're trying to make him whole again. So uh, I'd love for someone if who's listening out there, who's running the garage sale, call us in and let us know how it's going. They've been out there since 6.30 this morning. Wow. Good night. I wasn't there at wow. 6.30, by the way. Yes, I was still in bed trying to get over this cold I've got. But yes, Likewise. no, it's a great event. Get out there. If you want to get some great stuff and support a great individual and family, go out there. Again, what's that address, Rob? It's 741 East 11th Street. It's in the Heights. It's basically, it's Studewood and 11th Street. Now, Kay Weatherly with Pods right. donated a pod. We filled that pod up. It was full by Wednesday. So uh, Mike Huff, our owner of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Anderson Properties, was nice enough to allow us to put stuff inside the office. So I'm sure he's going to be happy to see all that stuff go. <laughs> and I told him it'd all be gone by uh, Monday. A lot of people did a lot of work. We were out picking up furniture yesterday. I think uh, Liam Helms, who is the recipient of, of this, did probably three or four truckloads yesterday. That is awesome. Stuff, well, it's so. a great cause, and they're, they're a great family and a great individual. And probably, so. more importantly, those who come out, the Rat Pack's going to show up over there after the yes, show. Yes, that is correct. We will, will be, be there on live, on, on site. site. Yeah, on site. So, <laughs> live! And, <you> know, <laughs> and in person. <laughs> and in person. You know, but we don't have, we don't have um, our individual following us around saying, Joe is in the studio. Or <laughs> Where can we get that guy? We, we, we should have got him to come on out, too. We definitely yeah. have to. You know, it, we got a great show planned today. You know, one of the things we're going to be talking about is a couple of items. Number one, we're going to be talking about major repairs associated with your property, mainly what to be aware of major foundation repair. and roofing. <laughs> and then on top of that, a lot of times if you're going through how to foundation, survive it. how to survive it through a how relationship. How to survive it. <laughs> that, that, it's an amazing show today, amazing. So all those listening, you want to stay tuned. We have some really good stuff coming up. We're going to start off with you know the basis of all homes foundation the foundations and and I ran it I've got John down I with thought it was going to be the big screen but. Uh, per appear I ran into him at a at a at a HAR of all places and we were talking about uh, you know we've been wanting to get somebody to on to talk about foundations that's probably one of the most misunderstood items in the house it's one of the biggest houses welcome John well good morning <laughs> So glad to have you here. Uh, and, you know, you and I talked about a lot of technical stuff about foundations, and I'm a former home builder, so I kind of have a, a working knowledge, but certainly not to the extent that you have knowledge. So we want to dispel myths about foundations and things like that. And I know a lot of times people will come out, uh, have you come out and have you look at a house, and they get really surprised. So tell me what some of the big surprises are for people out there. Well, I mean – First and foremost, I mean, the biggest kind of issue we have in the industry is that there's no licensing, no no certifications, anything like that in order Sweet. to go do this. I'm going into business uh, tomorrow. Yeah, well, I mean, you very well could. <laughs> I mean, and he could. <laughs> go get you Joe's a Foundation Repair. I'll be up on Facebook. Just look me That's up. That's right. You're there, just going to pick up truck and sign. I'm kidding. So, and, well, but that, if you have extensive knowledge, because like I said, I, you and I spoke for a long right. time, you have extensive knowledge about the technical aspects of foundations, and maybe even talk about the different kinds of foundations you see in Houston. I'd love to say, maybe start off with the different types of foundations there are, pier and beam, I, et cetera, et cetera. Didn't I just right. say that? Yes. Right. Clay. <laughs> well, well I mean, we were talking about the typically ground. speaking, we see what's your, your average slab-on-grade foundation. It means there's uh, a trenched-out formed, basically mold, in the soil that the builder makes, uh, and they fill it with rebar or post-tension cables, whatever they're choosing may be, and pour concrete on top of it, and away you go, build your house. Um, you also have the pier and beam homes. There's, that's typically speaking an older style home. Uh, however, there are some new builders out there that are building some pretty fancy new pier and beams. 
Um, in Bel Air, quite a bit, and in, West U also. Yep, exactly. We've we've actually done a little bit of work on some of those. Um, not a whole lot, just sort of some improvements, not necessarily repair, quote unquote. Um, you know, there are some coastal type homes that are down over towards the bay, but you know that's that's not really what we see in the Houston Metroplex. It's okay, more so. So I'm thinking of. Uh, now let's talk about post tangent slab. I think that is the probably for production builders that's probably the dominant player is, is absolutely post tension. Kind of talk and about it has what been for a little while, is. right? Oh yeah, yeah, for, yeah for, for a number of years. And but and and uh, you know for a long time, engineers were saying you know don't don't do post tension. But I understand that the methods have improved substantially, and post tension <laughs> actually does work. And kind of talk how it does work. Tell them how. Well, yeah, the the idea of putting a rebar in a sl- in concrete in order to give it a bone structure, if you will. Um, the cool thing about post tension is you can go and put that post tension cable in there. Not only do you give it a bone, like kind of like a bone structure, something for that concrete to form to and adhere to, but you also provide a kind of like a tensile force on around the perimeter, basically holding it together almost. Um, the the cool thing about post tension cables is they they're a little more forgiving than the rebar cables, the rebar type systems. Um, when we go to repair them, we don't see as many new cracks in the slab we don't see any when we go to raise them that is um they're just a little more effective they're efficient rather. well i guess the thing is because we have what uh in a lot of areas of houston uh, especially south of the bio is that we have alluvial soil which is a gumbo which is a clay and it's right. very expansive and when you put rebar which is reinforcing steel uh, it makes it very rigid, and it really doesn't have tensile strength at all. No, it does not. And the cable does allow a little bit of flexibility and things like that. Is that right. What you're so when you are when you're going out and you're taking a look at some of these slabs and you see some uh, failures or maybe it needs adjustments, what what are the probably the number one things that you see out there? Well, and once again, that that's a hard question to answer just because there's so oh, much. I like to ask the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to ask what your favorite color was. Well, that being said. <laughs> <laughs> Repeating joke now. <laughs> uh, probably the most common failure I see is, is going to be, I mean, it's all moisture related. Either you have too little too little, or too much. Very rarely do we ever run into a poorly constructed foundation. Now, we do on occasion, but once again, that's a rarity. What's the number one thing um, that you see that was done incorrectly that causes uh, failure or, or something not to perform properly? It's going to be a lot of lot of lot control, irrigation control, moisture control, um, you know, having real large trees or, or, or a lot of foliage that's concentrated in one area that draws a lot of moisture out of the soil. Um, see, a foundation problem is not necessarily a structural problem. It's a geological problem that produces a structural or structural ramification. Um, if the soil moves, then the home's going to move with it. And so, that's interesting, you know, because one of the things we hear a lot is, you know, during the summer when it gets really hot here in Houston – to look at your foundation and make sure you have enough moisture mm-hmm. going around it because I guess what can end up happening is if that soil dries out, that's what causes that weight sometimes. You know, soil moves out from underneath the the, the, the pad. It can crack, break, move, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yes and no. What basically happens is as we, as the soils, you know, soils here retain moisture. You know, that's that clay. You know, you, that's why you can go out in the yard and scoop up a handful of clay and just about make an ashtray out of it. Um <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. Um, I'm going to do that this afternoon, actually. <laughs> well, basically, you know, that soil retaining that moisture. Whenever soils do that, they expand, right? They gain their vol- they gain in volume, right? Um, when they lose that moisture, they contract, and they're basically losing volume. So a lot of that, you know, that that excess that that variable moisture content in that soil, causing it to expand and contract is what causes the movement. You know, when we lose moisture, we lose volume, that house will start to drop, you know, one side or another. So when we had that drought, how was, was your phone ringing off the wall? It was insane. <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting because that's what, that's what I'd heard from everybody in the foundation business, that that drought came, people weren't keeping their slabs moist, and all of a sudden people started seeing, uh, you know, I don't worry, really worry a whole lot about those cracks that go straight up down along the drywall lines. It's those... Those horizontal or those jagged uh, cracks that uh, that occur in the wall and stuff like that's when I start getting an alarm. Now we are talking right, about foundation, right. right? Yes. Okay, good deal. Well, I mean, you know, those are <laughs> those, those are signs of movement. You start seeing they cracks going Chris. across doorways, going over, you know, above window casings, <laughs> things of that nature. I mean, it's it's just a sign that something's moved. Yeah. So. Yeah, I remember walking to a client's house one time, and he said, "Well, I don't know of any foundation problem. I'm looking about an eight foot." Diagonal crack across the wall <laughs> and sheetrock right. separate part. And I go, you know, you might 
we kind of rethink that is that you really you are having some some movement issues, and it, and it, the house will tell you when something's going on. And, and what are acceptable norms? I mean, one of the things that we see a lot is you see an inspector go out there, an appraiser, and say, "I think you need to get a structural engineer out there and take a look." What are the acceptable norms? And you might or might not know this. I'm not sure as far as movement that are acceptable within ranges of, of traditional uh, foundation. I mean, I know they usually go out there and they'll go do these measurements and they'll put these little diodes in each corner and measure it and says, okay, it's within point zero zero one percent of movement. It's absolutely within the normal. Is there anything that, like, industry standard out there, or is everything sort of home-specific? It, it's more so home-specific. I mean, industry standard basically states that over a 10-foot span, you cannot have more than 1.2 inches of fall, which is a 1% grade. Now, that being said, a 1.2-inch fall over 10 feet is pretty aggressive. It's, it's a loose standard. Right. Um, so let's just, to make the math easy, if you had a 30-foot wall, you couldn't have any more than 3.6 inches worth of fall from one side to the other. Now, that being said, s- slope and deflection are two completely different things. You can be on an, e- on an even plane and be sloped from top to bottom and still remain basically in a straight line. Um, once we deviate from that straight line, let's say you've got you're you're straight on one end and at the in the middle of the slab it takes a dive off and then you're however many inches out of out of level well that's at that point considered deflection and that's where we have an issue um you know basically summing that up even planes keep framing keep all their structural components that help hold the house in in place and up upright you know as long as those are in line you're typically speaking okay. Once we start deviating from that even plane, we, you know, geometry becomes our worst enemy at that point. We start seeing framing moving, moving in places we don't want to see it move to. That's where we have that structural concern. Yeah, and, and I, I always believe in preventative things. And, and of course, one of the biggest mistakes I think that uh, people make is they'll go out and put these you know, nice petunias, legustrums, put it within mm-hmm. two foot of their house. I don't know that everybody knows that legustrum is really a tree. <laughs> right. Disguised as a as a shrub, as a shrub, yep. And so, what do you talk when you go out there and you and you see stuff like this? I mean, what do you what do you tell people? It's like, well, for one, I've I've learned through painful experience, never tell anybody to move a plant. That's <laughs> you're, you're you're asking for a, a black eye at minimum. Yeah, if looks could kill, at least. Um, you know, the basic basically the best the best thing you can do is keep that keep that foliage hydrated, uh, especially in the summer times. Like a big old giant live oak tree. I mean, that's liable to drink a hundred gallons of water a day. And, you know, making sure that that tree is, I mean, you're not going to be able to help it 100%. But and My understanding of, of uh, oak trees especially is that the uh, that the fruits will follow the umbrella of, of, mm-hmm. the, of the tree, and it will go into your slab, to get, and it will get moisture from somewhere. Oh, absolutely. I mean, those, I mean, trees aren't stupid. They know where to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but basically that, that canopy, you know, that root system is going to expend, extend that canopy in a half. So, uh and I was talking about this with someone yesterday who has a house in the River Oaks area, and they removed a big oak tree. Of course, you know, first of all, your big oak tree, you have to take in moisture out. But also, if there's already a root system in there, and you take out a big tree, right. you're going to have a lot of void underneath your slab and stuff. So how do you address that stuff? Because those big trunks dissolve, and all of a sudden you've got, you know, tunnels. Well, I mean, honest to goodness, I haven't run into any real big issues with leaving roots underneath your, underneath your home. Um, it, we run into them all the time. You know, there's, there's usually enough load support on either side of that route to really not make that big of a difference. Heck, we build, we dig tunnels underneath houses all the time. So when talking um, with you, your company and, and maybe other companies, and what, what would you like people to know that would distinguish your company, um, and how you deal with them? Well, first and foremost, I mean, honesty is our biggest key. I mean, like I told, like the first thing I said on the show this morning was that you don't need any kind of certification, licensing, education. I mean, any any Joe can go out there and go try and start their foundation repair company. Uh, what that's foundation repair on Facebook tomorrow. Well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I didn't make that connection before I said it. Uh, <laughs> no, but anybody can go out and start their foundation repair company. And the problem with that is we've been inundated with all these guys who are basically salesmen. You know, I'm not. I'm not going to go try and pick and choose. And, no, and, no, we're not trying to pick and choose. No, no, no. <laughs> but I can't tell you how many times, and I'm no longer an, an estimator, but uh, in my time as an estimator, I could, I'd walk in and somebody say, well, you need 12 peers or 50 peers or 100 peers at $10,000, $100,000, whatever it may be. I mean, I've walked in a home where somebody said, oh, I've got $90,000 for the foundation work, and I said, no, you need about $6,000, and it needs to cover this corner. You don't need to go raise the whole structure. Yeah. Well, I can, and I always um, appreciate that, especially right. when I'm doing an inspection like that, so... How can we get a hold of you? Well, I mean, you can visit us online. It's uh, www.permapeer.com. 
Um, and I'm sure y'all will probably throw some kind of link on the internet or something, right? Absolutely. We um, definitely will. Either that or you can give us a call. Uh, our office number, it's going to be 713-849-9993. That is Perma Peer. That is John Dowdy. Yep. You know what? We're coming up against a break right now. In fact, we're past our break right yeah, now, no, so stay uh-oh. tuned and we'll be Mike's right ready. back. Mike's <laughs> 